Let me give you a quick word on our format before we begin. Dr. Kraft will speak for about 40 minutes, after which we will have about 35 or so minutes for Q&A. We always have a problem with the Q&A because a lot of people don't really understand what a question is. It's always easy to get a question uh, confused with pontificating ad nauseum. I can see how you'd make that, uh, that mistake. A lot of people never get in front of a microphone and stuff just happens. But um, we want to keep that kind of magic to a minimum tonight. Uh, so thank you in advance for uh, hearing what I'm saying. But of course, there's someone here who's paying no attention. And we'll know who that is in about 40 minutes. Um, after we stop at 8.30, there's plenty more reception, more hors d'oeuvres, more wine. But now, of course, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Crave. Well, from somebody who has not suffered very much, you're supposed to receive some wisdom about suffering. That's an irony. All right, let's just plunge in. There's three kinds of evil that I want to talk about. Suffering, death, and sin. What we fear most, most of the time, is suffering. Then death, then sin. Exactly the opposite of what it should be. But... That's all right. I'll start with the problem of suffering. To live is to suffer. That was Buddha's first noble truth. The truth that he thought was the most obvious and indisputable truth in life. The data on which any quasi-scientific theory of human life must be erected. Pain is the most obvious problem in the world. This is no less true today... For now that our civilization has succeeded in conquering half of humanity's physical pains by anesthetics and medical technology and boogie boards, it has also doubled humanity's spiritual pains, depression, despair, divorce, which is more painful than death, other betrayals, loneliness, emptiness, meaninglessness, the existential vacuum. Viktor Frankl says, quoting Nietzsche, a man can endure almost any how if only he has a why. The how is the circumstances, including the suffering. The why is a purpose and a meaning. This is not a theory. This is an observation. Frankl was a scientist. He observed this to be true in the laboratory of Auschwitz. The corollary of this truth is that if we do not have a purpose and a meaning then we cannot endure any suffering that's inconvenient. Our culture seems to have made the Faustian bargain of giving up a better why for a better how. Giving up meaning for comfort. We've conquered the world of pain, but we've lost our soul, our meaning, our hope, our purpose. And that's why the physical pains that remain, though only half as bad in quantity compared to those of our ancestors, are twice as bad in quality quite as unendurable, without the meaning to surround them. The end result is that though the pains are less, we fear them and feel them more. It's like the difference between childbirth and abortion. To use a quantitative analogy for something that's not quantitative, the birth has a hundred pains, but a thousand transcendently meaningful joys. The abortion has only a dozen pains, but no joys. Suppose we took back our bad bargain, like Sidney Carton in A Tale of Two Cities, embracing Christ-like martyrdom for his beloved Lucy, wisely exchanging the whole of his material goods, his hitherto meaningless life, for the pain of the guillotine and the pleasure of spiritual good, moral meaning, including the hope for heaven. That was such an excellent bargain that Carton said of it, it is a far, far better thing I do than ever I have done. Or like Jim Elliot, the missionary martyr of Ecuador, who realized the same truth when he said to those who called him a fool for risking his life to preach to the savage Orcas, he is no fool to give up what he cannot long keep for what he cannot ever lose. Both Sidney Carton and Jim Elliot were echoing the wisdom of the man who said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Did any human being in all of human history ever utter a single more practical sentence than that one? 
Yet, though spiritual pain is deeper than physical pain, physical pain can be very deep and very troublesome. Its troublesomeness is not only physical, it dominates the spirit of everyone except those who are both the strongest and the sweetest of humanity. Pain is like a jealous tyrant with a whip, commanding all our attention at every moment, shouting, look at me, look at me. It's hard to meditate or calculate or compose music or poetry or discover great new scientific breakthroughs when you're being whipped or burned or cut all over your nervous system. Now, there are two obvious solutions to physical pain. No and yes. No tries to abolish it. And this is quite natural and good. And the modern West is very successful in doing that. Yes tries to somehow accept pain, but change our inner attitude towards it. And this is the answer of the ancient East, especially of Hinduism and Buddhism, and in the ancient West of Stoicism, which is a kind of non-mystical Buddhism. The modern West prays, grant me the courage to change what can be changed. The ancient East prays, grant me the serenity to accept what cannot be changed, and both pray for the wisdom to know the difference. But the modern West has not succeeded in conquering all pains by technology. Instead, it has created an artificial protective bubble that is empty of most of the physical pains of life that our pre-technological ancestors had to cope with. But we found the bubble also empty of meaning and thus spiritually painful. We've abolished 90% of pain and also abolished 90% of heroism and courage, which are no longer needed in the bubble. Each decade, we get a little closer to brave new world. That is, to the greatest pain of all, the pain of an absolutely meaningless life. To quote one of America's greatest philosophers, Yogi Berra, yes, we recognize wisdom even among the evil empire. <laughs> if this world was perfect, it wouldn't be. <laughs> right on. Brave new world, by the way, if you haven't read it, you must read it. It's a prophecy. If the West's problem is failure, I think the East's problem is success. For some people, at least, that is, for the spiritual athletes who practice Raja Yoga or Jnana Yoga or the Buddhist Noble Eightfold Path, pain is abolished by abolishing its root, desire. When there are no desires left, there are no frustrations left. Hindu or Buddhist yoga can indeed succeed in killing off the desires. The true Buddhist does overcome all pain, but also all pleasure. All fear, but also all hope. All hate, but also all love. All misery, but also all joy. This is a remarkable achievement, but is it worth the price of the abolition of half our human nature? It looks like spiritual euthanasia, killing the patient, the desires, to cure the disease, pain. I think, however, this is a misunderstanding. I must confess that the Buddhists that I have met have surprised me and impressed me with their peaceful alertness and spiritual aliveness. They certainly are not spiritually dead. But they have also surprised me with the inadequacy of their philosophy, their explanations. I must be as offensively honest with the East as I have been with the West, though, and protest that the freedom from pain is not worth the price. I will take the bitter with the sweet, thank you, the depth with the heights. Better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. From the moment of our birth, human nature includes two incompatible elements, the presence of pain and the demand for its absence. We all have pain and we all hate pain. Buddha's first noble truth and Freud's pleasure principle. What is pain? It is the disproportion between desire and satisfaction. In the words of England's richest philosopher, I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> and you can't always get what you want. The modern secular West tries to get the satisfaction. The ancient mystical East tries to get rid of the desires. The West tries to conquer pain. The East tries to conquer the fear of pain. Our common problem is that our desires are greater than our satisfactions. The West tries to change that disequation by bringing satisfactions up to the level of desires, 
Of course, this never works. While the East seeks the same end by the opposite means of bringing desires down to or even below the level of satisfaction. And this does work, but only for the practiced yogin or enlightened Buddhist. East and West both give us roads for escaping the problem. They're opposite roads, but they both escape the disproportion between desire and satisfaction, which is the formula for pain or suffering. What is the Christian alternative? C.S. Lewis says in The Problem of Pain, Christ came not to free us from our pains, but to transform them into his. That's the answer in one sentence. I'd like to try to unpack that answer. Christ does not solve the problem of pain. He changes it into a mystery. He plunges us into suffering instead of out of it, plunges us into its essence, its meaning, transforms the meaning of suffering, and not just by teaching about it, but by doing it, by acting. His way is the way into the deepest truth of suffering, instead of a way of escaping suffering and escaping its deep truth. And this deep truth at the heart of suffering is that there is life there, like a mother's birth canal, or like death, which is also a mother and also a birth canal and also suffering. In fact, all suffering is a little death, le petit mal. And death is the consummation of all our sufferings, all our losses, all our diminishments. You lose everything in death. This supreme loss becomes our supreme gain. And therefore, the little deaths, the little sufferings, participate in that. But this is very weird. This is totally different. This is not ordinary life, ordinary death, or ordinary suffering, or ordinary peace. He says, my peace is not the peace that the world can give. So his pain is also not the pain that the world gives. It's proactive. It's a weapon. The cross is a sword. It even looks like a sword held at the hilt by the hand of heaven and plunged into the earth like a syringe, not to suck blood like Dracula, but to give it. It's an act of spiritual warfare, freely chosen. It's a victory. It forces open a door at the heart of pain, a door that leads to something even better than pleasure. And that's a new kind of life. Worldly pain goes nowhere, or only to death. The cross goes to heaven. Christ doesn't give us this bloody road without first having traveled it himself. As T.S. Eliot says, the wounded surgeon plies the steel. God's answer to our pain was not a philosophy, but a person. I like to see Christ as the tears of God. Instead of telling us why not to weep, he wept and transformed human tears into divine tears. Christians believe that in Christ, God shared our human nature so that we could share his divine nature. And so he also shared our human pain so that we could share his divine pain, so that our very pains could become divine. He suffered for us not to make our sufferings go away, but to make them enter him, to make them his own. He changed not the existence, but the essence of suffering. Not the quantity, but the quality. The world, east or west, can change only one of the two contrary elements of suffering, desire or satisfaction, which are out of whack. Christ changes the whole essential meaning of suffering. That's why we can enter into it instead of escaping it, because it now has this new meaning. It is now redemptive. It is now the work of Christ. In the Garden of Eden, before sin, there was no suffering because there was no cause of suffering and no need for suffering. Once we became alienated from God, we also became alienated from God's world and from our own bodies. The alienation from the world is pain and the alienation from our own bodies is death. What Christ did about this on the cross was to change the meaning of pain by removing its first cause, its ultimate cause, separation from God. The word for that in Christian theology is sin. Sin doesn't just mean no-nos. It's an ontological term. It's like divorce from God, the source of all good. And he removed this forever. The world, even at its best, can remove only pain's proximate causes, either the surplus of desire or the defect of satisfaction. And it can do that only temporarily. 
Christians believe that they can enter into this mystery of the cross, not just mentally or subjectively or by imitation, but really, truly, ontologically, by incorporation. The word means literally embodying into the body of Christ. Christianity is a very materialistic religion. That holy body that suffered and died on the cross and suffers still in its members, that body is one and the same body in four places. It's on the cross, it's in heaven, it's in the Eucharist, and it's in the church, in his members. When Paul was knocked off his high horse by the light from heaven, and he said, who are you? And the voice said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He was doubly astounded. First, he didn't know that Jesus was divine. Secondly, he didn't know that Jesus was the members of his body that he was persecuting. This body of Christ that died on the cross is the body of Christ that ascended into heaven. And it is also the body of Christ that we receive in the Eucharist. It's one thing. And that's also the body of Christ that we call the church into which we are incorporated or embodied by faith and baptism. He's the one head of the one body. He doesn't have more than one body any more than the church has more than one head. That would make Christ a monster. Christ marries a bride, not a harem. He's not even a Muslim with four brides. He has one. And he's certainly not a monster with one body and more than one head. That's polytheism. So the total Christ, head and body, is neither polysomatic nor polycephalic. But that's some advanced theology. Let's go back into <laughs> basic practical stuff. Let's talk about what Woody Allen calls the biggie, death. I can ruin your whole day. In death, you lose everything. No matter what you've acquired in life, no matter how happy you've been in life, even if you've conquered the whole world, we all know that we're going to lose it all in death. Death drains oceans away. Death drains the universe away. As Pascal says, this is the end of the world's most illustrious life. They throw a few shovelfuls of dirt over your head, and that is all forever. Moralists tell us how to live good lives, but moralists too, and their good lives are destroyed by death. They must die, and their disciples, like Rhett Butler, death just doesn't give a damn. Whether you're a saint or a cad, you must die. Mystics show us how to live without fear of death, but they cannot show us how to live without death. They show us how to overcome fear by overcome ordinary consciousness with its egotism and attain instead a state of consciousness in which we no longer identify with the ego, the individual self that fears death. But mystics too must die, and so must their disciples. Whether we fear the monster or not, we are its victims, and it always wins. It doesn't give a damn whether you're a mystic or not. Philosophers sometimes tell us to be rational about death, to accept it as inevitable, and not to add to its power over us by hating it or fearing it. But philosophers too must die, and their disciples. We can conquer the fear of death, and much of the harm that this fear of death causes in our lives, but also the good that fear causes. Isn't it good to fear wild beasts if they're really around? But we cannot conquer death. We may have power over life, power to make it good or evil, pleasant or painful, but we have no power over death. We simply cannot conquer death. The good news of Christianity is that Christ has conquered death. What he said to the women at his empty tomb through his angels, then he still says to us, why do you seek the living one among the dead? I don't reside in the tomb of your thoughts or your words. You can't catch me. I'm like the gingerbread man. I'm not your object. My name is I am. You're my object. I once gave a questionnaire at Boston College to a class of 20 nuns. This was long ago, and there still were as many as 20 nuns. <laughs> and I asked them to list the three greatest living men. Only one out of the 20 mentioned Jesus Christ. The other 19 either forgot him or forgot that he's a man as well as God or forgot that he's alive. I think that tells you why there are no longer more than 20 nuns. <laughs> Let's talk about the third biggie, sin. Because we hear quite a bit about suffering and we hear quite a bit about death, but we don't hear much about sin anymore. Let's, let's have a good word for sin. 
of all of our problems, sin is the worst. It's worse than death. Because sin means separation from God, and God is the only source of all good and all life and all joy. Everybody knows about Jesus, but not everybody knows about sin. Everybody knows the good news, but not many people know the bad news anymore. Yet without the bad news, the good news is meaningless. The good news is that Jesus is the Savior. But from what? If there's nothing to be saved from, he's totally irrelevant. Hey, good news, you have been given absolutely free the right to a quarter of a million dollar triple bypass heart surgery. Aren't you thrilled? Good news, for the first time in human history, science has discovered a simple medical cure for the compulsion of funny walking like John Cleese in Monty Python. <laughs> Only if we know our need do we know who Jesus is. Jesus himself said, those who think they are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. He said this to the Pharisees. In other words, I'm irrelevant to you. I'm not your savior. I didn't come for you. What more terrifying words could be spoken than these? I never knew you. Are Pharisees still around? Sure, they're called pop psychologists. The old Pharisees said, I'm okay, you're not. Our new Pharisees say, I'm okay, you're okay. Both Pharisees say, we're okay. But we're not okay. That's the first part of the good news. How awful if we were okay. There's a wonderful char character in one of T.S. Eliot's plays, The Cocktail Party, Celia. She's a modern alienated girl, and she, she seeks out the psychiatrist at the cocktail party, and he says to her, why do you want psychotherapy? And she says, well, I'm hoping that you can show me that I'm insane. What? You want to be insane? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, that's my hope. I don't understand. Well, if I'm not insane, then the whole world's insane. I couldn't live that way. <laughs> Quite profound. The religious version of that is the title of a sermon by Kierkegaard. On the edification implied in the thought that over against God, we are always in the wrong. Wouldn't it be awful if we found out that we were right and God was wrong? I must confess that one of the questions I'm going to ask God uh, when I get to heaven, hopefully, is why for 86 years were you a Yankee fan? <laughs> but I think the movie Bruce Almighty finally did it for God. When he saw that hat on Jim Carrey, he said, enough. Seriously, we need to appreciate the problem before we can appreciate the solution. And the problem is not simply that we're imperfect, young piglets are imperfect, or that we're mixtures of good and evil, delicious strawberries with a few rotten spots are mixtures of good and evil. The problem is not just that we're sheep wandering away from safety, foolish, spoiled, selfish children. Of course we're that, but we're much, much worse than that. We're not just morally weak or morally bad. We are morally insane. The word probably shocks you and seems exaggerated and unrealistic. And that's part of our insanity, by the way, denial. So I shall now try to convince you from your own experience that you are insane. And I think if you are honest with yourself, you will not be able to deny the facts that I am about to remind you of. Even though perhaps no one has ever told you these facts before, unless you may have read the Bible or the writings of the saints. Very probably you've never heard them from your pulpit. Because your parish priest or minister probably desperately wants to be your friend and fears offending you. You know, we all know, there are some things we can't not know. You all know that there are two roads. There is good and there is evil. There is the straight and there is the crooked. There is the narrow and there is the broad. There is straight street and there is Broadway. You know that every day in life is full of big and little choices between those two roads. Beginning with your very first conscious thought as you wake up in the morning. You know very well what lies down those two roads. You know that not just by faith and not just by reason, but by experience. For you have walked down both roads many, many times, and you have always found the same living quarters there. You do not have to believe. You know the peacelessness and the joylessness and the regret and the shame and the, above all the hiding and the self-deception and the self-loathing that lies down one road. And you know who it is that you never meet on that road, who you abandon on that road. Sin means not just doing no-nos, but not doing God. 
Sin is a no not just to law, but to the lawgiver, who is love, who is the gift of self that is the secret of joy. And you also know, with equal certainty, and from the same experiential source, the deep peace and joy and satisfaction and even self-esteem that meet you down the other road. And who you always meet there. Who gives these gifts? And yet, you repeatedly choose Broadway over Straight Street many, many times. You prefer misery to joy. You are insane. Welcome to the human race. That's original sin. You know, as surely as you know the pain of a hangover or a headache, that every time you worship the creature instead of the creator, every time you give your deepest heart and love and hope to any other god but God, this false god always cracks and crumbles into dust. Always. You know that the pleasures this false god gives are only temporary, and that even when they come, they spoil all other pleasures, like a drug, destroying the enjoyment of other food. And you also know, as surely as you know a hot bath or a cold shower, what happens whenever you give your whole heart and life to God. All creatures light up with the light of the true sun. When you worship the creature, the lights of all creatures turn to darkness. When you worship the creator, all creatures flame out with beauty. You know that. And yet, you find it terribly difficult to obey the first commandment of sanity, to love the Lord God with all your heart. How much more insane could you possibly be? What is more insane than preferring misery to joy? Point one, then. We are all insane. That's my first noble truth. Point two. Why? What is the cause? If we find the cause, we may hope to find the cure. Psychologically, I think it's easy to find the cause of sin. Just watch how good and evil appear to you when you sin and how they appear to you when you don't. When you sin, the evil is more concretely present to your mind than the good. The evil is some forbidden pleasure, some indulgence of a lust or a greed or a fear that seems as real as bodily food. Good, on the other hand, seems remote and abstract, like a rosy cloud on the horizon, an ideal, a value, a law, a lifestyle, a pattern. The solution then, psychologically, is for evil to become abstract or for good to become concrete. But evil does not by itself become abstract. The devil does not withdraw to a distance voluntarily. However, good does become concrete. That event Christians call the incarnation. Divine goodness became a concrete flesh and blood human being named Jesus. And because he is divine, he is still present, now, here. God never disappears. God is presence. That's his name. I am. I present myself as a present to you in the present, now. So if God is on the cross, we can love the cross because we love God wherever he is. And that transforms the meaning of suffering and death. That's almost 35 minutes. It's 30. I'm not going to prattle for five more minutes. I'm going to give you five more minutes for asking questions because this is only a diving board and now starts the swimming pool. Uh, Hello, Professor. I'm actually a former student of yours from Boston College. You once told us a story in class we were reading uh, the Scroop Tate Letters, and you actually it stuck with me, a story about a former student of yours that had had a seance with the devil and had sort of lost the battle. So my question sort of relates to insanity. I was recently on the campus of um, Mount Holyoke College, and they have a Wiccan chaplain on the campus, and uh, which I had never heard of. This is apparently very, very common on college campuses now because the practice of Wiccan is so popular among young girls, especially well-to-do young girls. Could you say something about, I guess this relates to insanity, could you say something about the popularity of, uh, of these cultish things happening now? Oh dear. This is almost like asking me to say something about deconstructionism. My mother wouldn't like it because she used to say, if you can't say anything nice about somebody, don't say anything at all. <laughs> I think some Wiccans are just fooling around, but those that aren't are getting into something way over their heads. The itch to get into something way over your head is a dangerous but good thing. I'm going to say something that's going to surprise even me. I see something in the Wiccan, in the drug addict, 
in the terrorist that is lacking in ordinary people. Passion, infinite passion, horribly misdirected. But the passion that can lead to insanity, to self-destruction, to other destruction, to a Hitler. Just imagine if Hitler had been a saint. Imagine all that charisma and passion redirected. So instead of just making a stupid joke about it, as I did before, sorry, mom, and instead of just saying the obvious that this is dangerous stuff, maybe we should look more carefully about what the need and the fascination and the passion is, because in every evil in this world, you can find some good that's perverted. Nothing is evil in the beginning. You have to start with something good to pervert it. Evil's a parasite. And whatever good it is, we're not giving it to them. So I think they can teach us something. I don't know what that good is. Sense of mystery, maybe. Sense of getting in over your head. Surfing on a wave bigger than you can handle. But if God isn't that, then God's much too small. To show them that good is more exciting than evil. That's, that's rare. That's precious. Most of our novelists can't do that. One of the reasons Tolkien is the greatest writer of the 20th century is that he can do that. That's too long an answer. I'll try to keep them short. Uh, Dr. Crave, uh, a comment and then a uh, question. Uh, the fact that you're not wearing your Red Sox tie this time speaks volumes. Yes. And now a question. In light of what you've spoken of tonight, can you comment in a philosophical sense, in a real sense, on the issue of this national struggle over the recent case of Terry Schiavo? I'll just say two things. First, there's a question of proper philosophy, of casuistry, that is applying a moral principle to a particular situation. There may be some doubt, there may be some gray area about the difference between killing and letting die, the difference between a natural death and an unnatural death. But there is certainly not any gray area between the sanctity of life and the quality of life. To judge a human life as something that's not intrinsically valuable, but valuable only for another end, for social purposes, for sufficient pleasure, sufficient consciousness, and for somebody else to judge that, for somebody else to say, my will and my mind legislate for you whether your life is intrinsically valuable or not. That's literally idolatry. That's playing God. I'm sympathetic with those who are uncertain about end-of-life issues because our technology has made many things normal that used to be abnormal and many things ordinary that used to be extraordinary. So what is the difference between using extraordinary means to artificially prolong life and simply letting someone die? Uh, there are gray areas there, but there should be no gray areas about a principle. One of the favorite quotations of the greatest man in the worst century in history, Pope John Paul II, comes from a document of Vatican II. Man is the only creature in the universe that God willed for his own sake. In a secular version, this is Kant's categorical imperative. Man is an end, not a means. He must be loved, not used. Absolutely. Period. Sir, so what do I say to somebody who is basically a non-believer, but who is suffering from a serious illness? And what do I say to comfort her? There are two questions there. What do you say and what do you say to comfort her? I think you have to speak the truth in comfort. You have to speak the truth in love. Until the two can come together, you shouldn't say either without the other. And I think the cruelest thing you could say is the thing that's often said, namely, well, it's time to go now. I will compassionately aid your graceful exit because your life has become meaningless. You are worth nothing, or at least you are not worth the trouble of being kept alive anymore. I don't know anything crueler. In fact, I'd say that the supreme test of a philosophy is somebody's deathbed. If the philosophy makes no sense on their deathbed, then throw it away. And one of the things that does make sense on everybody's deathbed, no matter what they believe, is what Mother Teresa did to them. She said to everybody who was dying, you are infinitely precious, you are infinitely valuable, there's no one can, who can do what you're doing, even though uh, you don't think so, and even though you're dying, and even though you have only another few minutes to live and to think. That's infinitely precious. 
Do you believe those who suffer unjustly here on earth are in for special rewards in heaven and why? Well, in a superficial sense, that has to be true because justice isn't just our idea. Justice is the nature of the universe because it's the nature of God. But God's justice is so mysterious that we can't understand it very well. And it often appears to us as injustice. And I'm sure when we get to heaven, we'll we'll say, what, that's what I thought justice was? I'm going to make a, a sexist remark here. I think women, and in particular mothers, understand this much better than, than men. Because a mother is somebody who participates in one of the greatest and most wonderful injustices in the world. To be a mother means to be utterly unselfish in giving life to the most selfish creature in the world, a baby. <laughs> and we love it. That's the way life goes on. Um, it seems a lot of times when I read material on suffering, it talks about the character development you're going to receive from your suffering. And I have trouble processing that when it comes to certain suffering, for example, like if someone was abused as a child, you know, if they're reading that book, like how do they process that? And I, I just wonder what's the correct way to process suffering in, in front of my God, my relationship with him. I don't think there is any intellectual answer to that question. All answers that I've seen very quickly break down. And that's one of the obvious lessons of the book of Job. We don't understand what good it is for God to allow suffering X, Y, or Z, even though we may understand what good it is for God to allow suffering A and B. Obviously, if there were no suffering at all, we'd be in Brave New World and that would be awful. That's Yogi Berra's point. But why so many? Why so randomly distributed? Why don't we see everybody who suffers become a hero? We don't know. But that shouldn't disturb us that much because, to quote Woody Allen again, there's a movie where he's a Jewish father and his wife is on his back because their son has become an atheist. And his wife says to him, he's an atheist because you didn't explain the meaning of life to him. You didn't give him religious instruction. You didn't, you didn't answer his questions. So Woody says, what, what questions? What does he want to know? Well, he says, if there is a God, why are there Nazis? And Woody says, I should tell him why there are Nazis? I don't even know why the can opener works. How do I know why there are Nazis? <laughs> There's wisdom there. <laughs> if there were a God, suppose, suppose you're an atheist saying, I can't believe in a God who was allow allows so much apparently meaningless suffering. All right. If the hypothesis of God were true, it would logically follow that the mind of God would be to our mind something like the mind of a human being is to the mind of a, a worm or an intelligent tulip or a TV producer. And in that case, we couldn't understand most suffering. If, on the other hand, we could understand exactly why such suffering was there, that would seem to prove that uh, the universe was run by a mind not much superior to our own. That's not a very interesting God. So the answer is not thought. Thought only goes so far. Thought is like a car that takes you effortlessly to the beach and then you have to run in the water and jump and trust and swim. And that's what religion is. If there were answers, we wouldn't need faith. Faith means not just a leap in the dark, but a leap into somebody's arms. Here you are in the burning building and your eyes are full of smoke and there's a voice that comes from the street. This is the fire department. We have a net, jump. And you say, I can't see you. And the voice says, that's okay, I can see you. Jump. You have that great line, we're not morally good or bad, we're morally insane. And we know that because we start with the preposition that we know there's good and evil. What's the answer when the operative philosophy of society is skeptical relativism, where there is no good or evil, there is no right or wrong? And what road does that take you down and what can you do about it? Read the books of J. Bud Zizewski, who will show you that... There are some things you can't not know and that the person who says there is no real good or evil is lying to himself and he knows it. He's suppressing it. That's as old as St. Paul in Romans. They hold down the truth in their unrighteousness. Well, it's there. It's Freudian suppression. We don't just suppress our id. We also suppress our superego. You fight with all the weapons at your disposal. You start with the M1 rifles of philosophers with their syllogisms refuting all the arguments for moral relativism, which are silly. And you even read second-rate books like A Refutation of Moral Relativism by some guy named Peter Crave, 11 Socratic Dialogues. 
And then you need to go in for deeper stuff, like Ratzinger. But that's just M1 rifles. The only thing that can save our society is not philosophers, but saints. So you have to be one. Not everybody can be a philosopher. Everybody can be a saint. Even the atheist Camus knew that the meaning of life is to be a saint. He agonized over how you can be a saint without God. He never solved it, at least in this world. How ironic that the atheist knows you have to be a saint even though he doesn't believe in God, and we believe in God and we're not saints. Let's catch up with Camus' wisdom. Um, actually, touching on that, you mentioned that part of the uh, problem with sin is making uh, the good more real. Could you touch on how you do that in your own life as far as making the good more real on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis? Well, not only am I scatterbrained and have ADD, but I'm also a pampered, typically modern, undisciplined, very unsaintly person. So I use the simplest and most basic method of prayer. It's called practicing the presence of Christ. He's there. He's concretely there. It's not an idea. It's not a method. It's not a gimmick. He's there. There are few sins that you will commit on your deathbed when God is right there. But we're on our deathbed now. So we just remember that. The Muslims have a word for it. It's gafla or gaful or something like that. It starts with G-E-F. It means remembering Allah, remembering the supreme reality. We're incredibly forgetful. So we just have to say, thanks, I needed that. And remember in whose presence we are. I have a question. Um, I'm just wondering, how come, and maybe you have an answer to this and maybe you don't, how come some people have many episodes of suffering in their lives? They seem to have tragedy after tragedy and other people do not. What is the meaning of that? In general, I can give you an answer. In particular, I can't. It's the can opener principle. In general, the answer is, and here I'm going to give you two theological drawbreakers, original sin and vicarious atonement which means solidarity in the problem and solidarity in the solution. The human race is a family. We are not individuals who join families. We enter this world through a family. We are first members of a family before we become individuals. If you discovered that Adolf Hitler was literally and physically your grandfather, you would feel ashamed. Why? You didn't do his crimes or approve of them. Well, it's in the family. Well, he is. Eight degrees of separation, that's all. He's your great, great, great uncle, cousin, whatever. Or if somebody in your family becomes a great hero, you feel proud. Why? You're not a hero. It's all in the family. All right, original sin means this is all in the family. The whole tree is full of sap. We're all saps. But there's also new sap in the whole tree. Vicarious atonement means that the the sufferings of one can help another. Even if they don't help me, they can help you somehow. I don't know how. I don't even know how gravity works. But when I... Sorry, I was just about to say, how can that be Well, you can know that a thing is so without knowing how it's so, even the can opener. Here, gravity. Does any scientist explain why all matter is in love with all matter? No. Just how it works. I drop this book and the moon quivers just a tiny bit. Because every particle of matter in the universe exercises a gravitational attraction on every other particle of matter in the universe, which is precisely measurable depending on the two factors of, of mass and distance. So if all matter in the universe is one family, isn't it more likely, at least as likely, that all spirit, all souls are one family? And every good that I do helps you a little bit. Just as if I have a pee in my shoe, I can't think very well. Well, if all of us are like one body, then if I'm the, the pee in your shoe... Just can't think very well. I didn't mean that literally. <laughs> I'm a devout uh, Jew or a devout Muslim or a devout uh, Sikh. What is your notion of uh, the meaning of suffering? Have to say to me without the idea of conversion. Are you a Hasidic Jew or a Reformed Jew? Are you a Sufi Muslim or are you an establishment Muslim? Okay, plumb plumb the depths of your own mystical tradition and you will find uh, very similar principles. Strikingly similar principles. You will find, for instance, that God is not simply an authority figure and a first cause, 
but is the secret of joy and love and peace. And that if you are a Muslim, Islam or submission to God, which is the heart of all true religion, produces a peace, a shalom, that nothing else can produce. Because God is the still point of the turning world, the solution to all problems, even though you don't see it. So you have to actually get there. You have to get close, not fuzzy, cuddly, intimate close, but close like the point of one circle to the point of another circle. Or if you're a Hasidic Jew, the life that bubbles up in human joy is the very life of God. And God is so present that a Hasidic Jew would be very familiar, uh, very comfortable with Augustine's famous description of God as the one who is more present to me than I am to myself. Now, the way many Christians, unfortunately, try to attain that and to overcome the distance is to make God cute and cuddly and nice and sweet and human in the sense of human-sized. No, that won't work. Paradoxically, it's the very otherness and transcendence of God that makes him able to be so close just as light transcends all colors and therefore can be totally present in every color, just as the sheer act of existence transcends any finite essence and therefore can actualize every finite essence from within. There are all sorts of analogies to it. So mystics of many traditions understand the deep secret of of intimacy with God. Now, as a Christian, I believe that when they get to heaven, they're going to meet Jesus and say, and, and, and he's going to say, congratulations, you found my secret, but not my face until now. It was I who helped you to do it. And that'll be a surprise. But uh, I think many of them are, are deeper into the heart of Christ than many of we, most of us are. Could you comment on the power of prayer against the wages of sin? Can I comment on it? Yeah, what do you want me to say? <laughs> do it. Yeah, I can comment on it, but wouldn't it be better to do it? It's amazing how many words are spoken about prayer and how, many, how few are spoken in prayer. Look at Job again. Look at all those words of the three friends. Uh, they all talk about God. They never talk to him. Job's confused, but he talks to him. And that's why when God shows up, he says to Job, the heretic who shook his fist in God's face and said, you bloody butcher, how dare you get off with running the world this way? He said to Job, I like the way you talk to me. And he said to the three friends who said, oh, God is great and God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. And they just draped a little bit more poetry around it uh, and were very orthodox. And everything they say can be found in the rest of the Bible. He said, I'm mad at you. You didn't speak rightly about me. Why? Well, because he was present and they treated him as absent. Suppose right now, while I was talking, two of you should break out in loud, animated conversation about Dr. Crave. Do you think he's sane? No, I think he's insane. He's sane. He's insane. (laughs) Nah. But he's written all these books. Yeah, he's he's, he's written more books than he's ever read. Uh, (laughs) Well, I would be slightly amused and slightly annoyed that you interrupted a, a good thing. But most of all, I would be annoyed that you talked about me as if I were absent. It's a quite reasonable hypothesis that I am insane. In fact, I just proved it. <laughs> but, but to say this, it's like teenage girls often complain about their parents discussing them. What are we ever going to do about Sally? She is, hello, mom, hello, I'm here. <laughs> well, God's doing that all the time. What are we going to do about God? Hello, I'm here, talk to me. All the time. He's here all the time. Talk to him all the time. There's all sorts of stuff going on in the unconscious. You can talk to God while you're doing other stuff. Well, we better learn it because that's what we're going to do in heaven. How do we best address, I mean, for those of us that work on Wall Street, you know, questions like, how did God allow 9-11? Or on a more individual basis, if we face a situation, say, of a a parent losing a child that's uh, suffered horribly with a disease for a long period of time and never did anything wrong. Uh, How do we address the making sense out of suffering question? All right, the strictly intellectual question, I think, is best addressed by analogies. What's a good manager? What's a good parent? What would be a good president? Somebody who micromanages? 
who interferes with everybody's life to prevent all sorts of suffering, who does your kids' homework for you all the time, or who grants freedom. Now, we can't be God even if you wanted to be, but suppose we could. It still wouldn't be good to micromanage. God's policy, since he's love, is that we do our own homework, we learn from our mistakes, and of course he foresees that we're not going to learn from our mistakes sometimes. So the only choice is to let us fall and sometimes get up and sometimes not, or not to let us fall. Now, how can we judge which is the better choice? The critic really is saying to God, you know, if I were running the universe, I could do a better job than you are. All right, follow that out. What would you do if you were God? Well, even Jesus didn't heal everybody. He did more miracles than anybody else, but how many blind men did he heal? 20? How many were in Israel? 20,000? What about the other ones? Why didn't he heal them too? Why didn't he hang around for 2,000 years? Why didn't he march into hospitals and zap everybody into health? Well, once you go down that road, where do you stop? Here, 9-11 is about to happen. What does God do? He puts a force field in front of the World Trade Towers and then gently turns the plane around. All right, that's nice. Then they land and, uh, and the terrorists are captured. And if the terrorists try to slit somebody's throat meanwhile in the plane, the knife turns to butter and it feels nice. All right. The terrorist is now in prison and he's full of hate. And that's just as bad as physical terror. So God has to perform a little frontal lobotomy and turn his brain to butter and give him nice thoughts. Before any evil can arise, God has to turn it to good. Well, the result of that would be Brave New World, a world without freedom. So the critic is asking God to either not allow any evil, which means taking away freedom, or not allow that much evil. Well, how much? What's the quantity? If you can quantify human suffering, let's say, let's abolish 50% of suffering. Well, we've done that. We've abolished more than 50% of suffering in the last 50 years. A single technological invention, namely anesthetics, has probably ab abolished more than half of all human suffering. We've done that. It hasn't made us saints. It's a good thing. It hasn't solved the world's problems. If you think that through, play God, you're God for a day, like in the Jim Carrey movie, which is a pretty good theological movie, by the way, it collapses. So what are you left with? A justification of the way God runs the universe? No. The universe is a big can opener. We don't know how it works. So you're left with, with the presence of a God who says to you, as he says to Job, after Job asked all these profound questions, basically, hush, child, you couldn't possibly understand. We just have to hear the Father's voice. Ours, of course. Why is it our responsibility? Because God won't do it without us, and we can't do it without him. And he's always willing, and we're not always willing. And you also demonstrate by the uh, theory of quality, right? Because like, we fall in this, in this particular position, in this particular family, so we just fall in this theory, so we couldn't help ourselves. No, the point is not that we can't help ourselves. The point is that we are all interdependent on each other. The point is that just as when I throw some pollution into the atmosphere, everything in the atmosphere is a little polluted. So when I throw a bad deed into the world, everybody's harmed. And when I throw a good deed into the world, everybody's helped. I didn't say that. I said we shouldn't rely wholly on thought when we're looking for God. 
meaning is the object of thought. What criterion should we use if we are trying to decide if something is revelation or not? Thought criteria. Criteria, by definition, are intellectual. It's absolutely essential that you have an accurate roadmap, that you don't get suckered in by fake salesmen. So I'm not saying anything at all against thought. Most of us think far too little, not too much. But I'm saying there's something even deeper than thought. Death is an evil. And I wonder if that's necessarily true. The suffering of the evil. We don't do we again getting into things beyond our intellect. Do we know that death is an evil? The word evil has two different meanings. There's moral evil and physical evil. There's the evil you do and the evil you suffer. Now, death is the evil that you suffer. And even if it's not physical pain, it's loss. So in that sense, it's evil. You're deprived of life. Now, if you don't have life, you can't have any of the other good stuff in life. So life is the first and primary good. So since death deprives us of that, it's a primary evil. Yes. If you don't think life is very good, then death is great. So it depends on how much value you put on life, whether you think death is a great enemy or not. I was assuming that uh, life is a great good and therefore death a great evil. Without death, life is something good. That's true too. It is a necessary evil. Without death, uh, we'd have hell on earth. We'd be rotten eggs, never hatching. And that may come. That may come. I think that the most catastrophic event in the entire history of the world after the fall from Eden may come in the 21st century. The discovery of technological artificial immortality by genetic engineering. Half the geneticists in the world think it's theoretically possible. All you got to do is freeze the aging process or reprogram it. Just imagine you never die. You're Howard Hughes for another hundred years. You're the Third Reich for another thousand years. You're the Roman Empire for another thousand years.